Hi everyone, welcome to our SIGUX webinar on Microsoft licensing. Um, Tim, Tim Lilly and Jason Watson will be our presenters today. My name is Beth Rugg and I'm the facilitator. I know Tim has prepared quite a bit of content, so we're just going to jump right into the meat of the session. If you have any questions, there will be natural breaks during the webinar where you can ask questions, but feel free to chat them in and I'll, help, I'll let Tim and Jason know that you have a question. So this is being recorded and it will be available on the SIGOX website uh, sometime within the next few days. With that, Tim, I'm going to turn it right over to you. Beth, thank you so much and uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, share our uh, info with the members. Uh, um, without going into too much information about us, uh, Jury Ed manages hundreds of Microsoft agreements, EES, OBS, ES, Select, uh, open agreements, all for academic uh, customers. And so uh, um, we're, we feel like we're in a pretty good position to share our, our licensing knowledge with you. I've done quite a bit of research on this, uh, 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 on you know all the permutations uh, that that pertain to the Microsoft agreements. And then uh, Beth also sent me a list of questions in advance. We'll go through those questions as I go through the presentation. So um, our basic agenda is as follows. First, we're going to talk about the licensing program options, whether it's perpetual or subscription. We're going to spend most of our time talking about the subscription-based licensing because in higher education, it's, uh, most schools have subscription-based licensing, and if you don't, the, the value is so high on it right now, you, sh you should. Um, we're going to talk about Office 365. We're going to reference the uh, Volume License Service Center, and for those of you who don't have access to the Service Center, I'll show you a little bit about how that works and what's, what's available there. We're going to talk about software assurance benefits. We're going to talk about how desktop products and server licensing are, are added to an agreement. We're going to talk about Azure. And then throughout the course of the, the presentation, we'll have uh, time for, for questions and answers. So, um, so the first thing is, let's talk about the different program options that are available in education. And most of you have or used to have or are looking into um, the Microsoft Campus Agreement, and, and now they call it the Microsoft EES subscription. And uh, what it is, it's, a, it, it's this program started in 2000 with a, you know one uh, bundle of six different products. And Microsoft had an interesting uh, concept at that time, and that is instead of counting your computers to determine the cost of your software licensing, let's count your people instead. And so the pricing is calculated by FTE count, which turned out to be a pretty smart idea because it's a lot easier for a school to determine how many faculty and staff they have, how many students they have on an annual basis than it is to count all the devices that are um, you know, at the various uh, buildings. And in a, lot, in a lot of cases in higher education, you have um, you know, campuses that are located 30 or 50 or 100 miles away from each other. And so if you just count all the people, that's a way that uh, they, they can determine your size and then determine what it's going to cost to site license to give you full access uh, to whatever suite of products it is that they make available. And as I said at first, they just made a, a, a standardized bundle, what they call the desktop bundle, available for, uh, for, the, for the schools. And then over time, they've kind of changed the program around. And we'll talk about those changes as we go through. Um, you're currently. The desktop product includes Microsoft Office for both Mac, Windows Upgrade, and core client access licenses. And we'll, we'll go into detail about what all that means and uh, slides down the road. The other benefits of the EES subscription is that you can lock in your pricing for three years, so, you just, so, so it's easier to budget uh, for the agreement, um, that uh, um, you get soft assurance benefits, which we'll go into again on, on a later slide. Um, and that, uh, in the case of the EES subscription, um, it's a little better pricing, but you have to have a 1,000 FTE aggregate to qualify. And then you must purchase that program through a Microsoft LSP. They used to call Microsoft LARS. There's only a few of them in the country. Um, but now uh, they refer to them as LSPs. And then there's a physical program signature form that is required to initially enter into the EES subscription. Um, the, uh, 
a, a companion program to EES is the Microsoft OVS ES subscription, which is almost completely identical to EES, um, but the pricing is a little higher. Your minimum qualifying purchase is five FTE, um, and then and the, and the signature forms aren't physical; they're electronic. And then the, the OVS ES can be purchased through any Microsoft AER. There's a couple other smaller changes as well. Um, the reason why many of you may have EES subscriptions is that if you're part of a statewide association that, that purchases this as a group, you may qualify for EES even though you as a school only have you know, something less than 1,000 FTE. And, and again, when, we, when I refer to FTE in, in this part of the discussion, it's faculty, staff, FT. We're not talking about students here. Hey, Tim, just a quick question. What does EES yes. stand for? Oh. Uh, Enrollment for Education Solutions. Thank you. You're welcome. And then, it's, uh, and then for OVS, it's Open Value Subscription Education Solutions. So, uh, so those are your subscription-based programs. And basically what subscription means is every year you renew it. Um, you don't technically own the software, but as long as you continue to renew the subscription, and, and many schools have renewed them for years and years and years, um, then you have no concerns about whether you have to remove the software from any of the computers or whatever. Um, there are probably still some of you that have perpetual licensing instead of subscription-based licensing, and maybe you have a mix of both. Maybe you cover uh, the, uh, all of your Microsoft Office and Windows on a subscription-based program, but maybe you license your servers through a perpetual license program. Um, or maybe you just, uh, you're decentralized and, uh, you know, your medical college, all the money you just at the, you know, at the doctor level and the IT department is very underfunded. And so you force those users to buy individual perpetual licenses to cover their Microsoft. And so uh, you know, those options are still available. There's two of them. Your standard perpetual license option is the Microsoft eOpen licensing. And, and that is just individual perpetual licenses at economic discount. Your first transaction has to be five units or greater. Subsequent order, orders, you just supply your, your reseller or your distributor with a Microsoft authorization number, and then you can just order single units in subsequent orders. Um, you can obtain software assurance separately for 24 months under eOpen, and then again, any Microsoft AER, which is Authorized Education Reseller, um, can handle those transactions. And, and so if you have a local guy or whoever, that's, that's fine. The Select Plus is, again, it's more of a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it requires a commitment, but you get better pricing, about 20% better pricing than you do under eOpen. But it is, again, a perpetual licensing program for academic customers. You're, you have a 500-point minimum per transaction pool, and, or per, you know, per pool, and there are three pools under Select Plus applications, which is your office and project and Visio, you know, operating systems, you know, Windows Upgrade, et cetera and Windows Server. And uh, uh, probably the one, Select Plus is very popular in other verticals such as government and healthcare because it enables you to obtain software assurance for 36 months but even, but pay for that software assurance in annual installments. In academia, it's not used very much because if you're gonna pay for your software assurance annually, the EES or OVS ES is a better program because you're licensing by FTE, you're not licensing by computer count, and for the most part, schools have more computers than they do FTE. So there's a pretty significant cost savings to, uh, uh, to licensing by FTE. Uh, but uh, the Select Plus is available. You can qualify for Select Plus as an add-on if you already have an EES agreement without the purchase commitments, um, but, but again, we're going we're gonna to talk about whether there's even value to that. Um, for mo many of the schools are just licensing everything under subscription, and uh, in my humble opinion, I think it's the better, better way to do it if, if possible. Um, there's also a, a potential that if you're part of a state association, the state has a select plus agreement, so you don't have to sign your own contract. You can just 
make those purchases available to your departments or individual users that want something outside of your, your subscription. Um, and then again, when we talk about the Select Plus, it is a, uh, it is a signed agreement just like yes. So it requires a signed program signature form, has to go through a Microsoft LSP, and then over the course of the, of the contract, once a year, they will review the, your, your purchases to determine whether you're meeting the points for the individual pools. Once in a while, Microsoft will pull people out of pools and say, hey, you haven't bought enough Windows upgrade to continue to have this contract for this pool. You're going to have to move to eOpen. Um, uh, so again, there's some amount of management in running a Select Plus contract as an individual school. So a lot of the schools that purchase off of Select, they do it as part of a state agreement rather than having a license to manage it themselves. So that, so that was quite a bit of content just about the, the licensing programs in general. Are there any questions around uh, Microsoft licensing programs? All right, so let's move on. So when we talk about Microsoft subscription licensing, I'm mostly talking, while I'm talking about EES and OVS, ES, since they're identical programs, I'm not going to segregate them in the further discussion, um, but I just want to have this basic discussion around how you enroll in these, in these programs. So uh, when it comes to subscription licensing, the first thing that you do is you choose a desktop product. Microsoft requires that one of the three or the entire bundle has to be part of any subscription-based agreement in order for it to be a qualifying agreement. Um, there used to be a time where you could just buy servers by themselves and put them on a, on a subscription-based agreement, but now they've kind of do, done away with that. There might be some legacy agreements out there, but for the most part, your subscription-based agreement has to include you know, one or more of these components of the desktop bundle. Um, and then again, your, your, your desktop bundle, which includes Office, Windows Upgrade, and CoreCal, is your best value. Um, you can parse out those components individually and uh, buy them by themselves. For example, if, uh, if you can't justify Windows Upgrade because every time you bring computers on, they're always new computers, and they already come with an OS, and you don't use Macs, so you have no need for, um, for dual boot capabilities then you can just buy the Office Pro by itself. Um, uh, the Office Pro includes Office for Windows, Office for Mac, and then the student, faculty, and staff Office 365, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, Windows Upgrade now includes MDoc, which will, that's the desktop optimization pack, which we'll cover on another slide, and VDA capabilities for virtualized instances. Um, and that one's becoming more important as we get into more of a, uh, uh, you know, BYOD environment. Uh, uh, a lot of times you're going to want to um, put your content on the Windows servers and then access them through a device that doesn't necessarily have an OS. But if you cover Windows Upgrade, it, it turns into your qualifying OS and then you don't have to buy an OS. Um, and then Windows EDU is part of the Windows Upgrade package, not Windows 10 Enterprise. There's practically no difference between the two of them, but uh, Microsoft created a, uh, a, a Windows version specifically for education and for deployment in education, and they call it Windows 10 EDU. So that's your entitlement under the Windows upgrade. And then you have your core cal. Now, there, uh, there was an actual question that came in from the group asking, well, what is core cal and why do I need it? And uh, so first, we'll talk about what it is. CAL stands for Client Access License. And uh, years ago, when Microsoft first started uh, making server licenses available, they forced you not only to license the server software itself, but they wanted you to license each user or each device that connected to that server. And I'll have more details on this in a later slide. Um, but all, all of the core CAL is all the client license accesses is it's a legal use right for this user or this device to access this server, whether it's a Windows server, Exchange server, SharePoint server, Skype, and you can see all the core CALs that are covered under the basic agreement. Um, and, uh, system Center endpoint protection, and we'll get into System Center a little bit more in a later slide as well. There, there were some questions around a new System Center, which uh, I'm going to try to answer. We may not be able to get all that answered. Tim, there's and a then once, 
Yeah, go uh, ahead. Sorry, a t quick question. How are the Windows licenses for dual boot Macs handled? Okay, uh, I do have this on another slide, but basically the way it works is, 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 is it's like this. So one of the software assurance benefits of the Windows upgrade is that you may uh, install qualifying operating systems. And so Microsoft considers the Mac OS a qualifying operating system. So as long as you license Windows upgrade for your FTE count, it gives you unlimited ability to install full versions of Windows OS on a Mac as part of a dual boot environment. And uh, they came out with this, this uh, with this uh, um, this verbiage, and I have a, a I have backup data on this if, if the if the school needs it. But uh, about seven or eight years ago, when schools first started dual booting off a of Mac on a in a regular basis, Microsoft had to make a decision on it. What they decided was is there was no way for them to be able to enforce whether you were running dual boot or whether you were upgrading from a Mac OS to a Windows OS. There, there was no way for them to legally determine whether you were in compliance or not. So they wrote it in as a software assurance benefit so, so, that, um, so that if you just bought the OS, you didn't qualify for the dual boot, but if you bought the OS with software assurance, you do. And, and of course, all subscription-based licenses have software assurance and therefore the qualification. So, so if any of you are paying for Windows OS um, so, uh, separately for all these Macs that you have, you don't have to do it anymore. You, as long as you license Windows Upgrade for your FTE count, then uh, you can go forth and conquer and you know, put as many dual boots as you want. Other questions before I move on, Beth? Nope, you're all good. Thank you, Tim. All right, good. All right, so the next step, now that we've licensed the desktop product, now we want to choose the add-on products. And uh, again, at one point in time, Microsoft didn't offer add-on products as an option, but now they offer all sorts of different add-on products. Uh, you can add desktop applications, such as Project and Visio. You can license those by your entire FTE count at a discount, or you can license them by user. You can add server licenses. Um, anything from Windows Server, SQL Server, any Microsoft Server product for the most part is available uh, as an add-on product. You can add other annual subscription products. And some of these are available for free, such as Office 365 E3 and Office 365 Pro Plus. You can add Azure AD Premium and Azure Monetary Commit, uh, which again, we'll go into details on that on another slide. Intune is another um, the desktop management tool that is becoming more uh, used more on, uh, at schools. IT Academy, which is a great set of learning tools and videos, uh, can be added in subscription-based licensing, Parature, Power BI, other, other online services for projects and Visio. These are all available as add-on licensing. And uh, um, if any of you have been involved in the Microsoft EES subscription licensing, the price list is just huge uh, as far as all the different add-on products and uh, we can help you sort it out or other re you know resellers that are good at Microsoft licensing can help you sort it out when you get to that point okay so now we talk about and again this should be this is probably review for a lot of you but uh, I wanted to cover all parts of Microsoft licensing so um, here's how you calculate your FTE and again whenever we refer to FTE we're always talking about faculty staff FTE unless we parse out the student option as a separate program. Um, so in the case of calculating your FTE count, the formula is listed below, full-time faculty plus part-time faculty divided by three, plus full-time staff plus part-time staff divided by two. That's how you determine your faculty staff FTE. And you can go to your, uh, uh, to your business office and pull those numbers. Usually they come out in August every year. Um, and so you can use whatever the latest numbers are. Um, you do not have to true up during the course of the agreement. So if you add 20 staff throughout the course of the year, you can wait until the following year to update your FTE count. That's one thing worth noting. The other thing worth noting is that if they're not computer users, you can take them out of the count. Um, so if you have maintenance employees or cafeteria workers or other people on, on campus that are, you know, don't use the computers at all or don't use any of the software, then you know, you don't have to include them in the count. Keep in mind, right, if you have an on-premise Microsoft Exchange server and those users are getting emails, 
you know, than they are a computer user because they're touching your, your exchange server and they're getting an exchange cal. So um, it's only those that are completely segregated from the from the network that aren't computer users at all that you would take out of that uh, FTE count. And then if you cover student option, which there's almost no need to do that anymore um, due to the fact that Office 365 is now free, the way you would calculate your student FTE is that your full-time students plus your part-time students divided by three. Okay, I, I, want, I just added this slide this morning because I wanted to talk a little bit about the three-year option. Many of you may be confused about the idea that once you enter into a three-year option that you're locked in. And there's some amount of truth to that in that you lock in your pricing for three years with annual payments once you check the three-year box. If you're on an EES agreement, the way you check the three-year box is it's part of the program signature form, the, the enrollment form that's associated with the program signature form. If you're OBS ES, then when you sign the agreement form electronically, then you choose the three-year option. Um, uh, but the idea behind it is, is to help you budget. You can lock in your pricing for three years with annual payments. Um, when you renew, you have to renew with the same or greater FTE and product selection. And then if products are discontinued or changed, then those, you, you can remove those products or move to whatever the new SKUs are. Um, for example, Windows Server is about to change um, the way that it's licensed, so you can move from the, you know, the you know, previous data center licenses to the new data center licenses. Um, probably the most important thing that I wanted to convey about the three-year option is, is what Microsoft refers to as evergreen. And what that means is you have all the options. So you can continue to um, go down that three-year path, or if you had massive layoffs, or you've decided that there's certain technologies of Microsoft that you no longer use for one reason or another, and you need to reduce the size of your agreement, um, you can get out of that three-year option in year two or in year three, and you can start a new three-year option, or you can go back to one-year options. Um, in my opinion, there's almost no reason to sign a one-year option uh, because it's so easy for you to get out of the three-year option and you have the added benefit of locking in your pricing if you stay in it. Um, obviously, if you get out of the three-year option, then the pricing is no longer locked. You'll go into whatever the pricing is currently uh, for the agreement, but, that's, uh, but the concept behind it, the being able to enter into a new agreement anytime you want, is uh, attractive to some. I mean, some of you, if you have to bid out your agreement and you know, staying in the three-year option prevents you from bidding out the agreement, I mean, there's other considerations, obviously. Okay, so any questions about how to enroll in the subscription-based licensing? Okay, so we'll move on into Office 365. So this came out uh, two, two or three years ago. Microsoft made it available for you to add Office 365 Pro Plus to your agreement for your students, faculty, and staff at no cost. And uh, I think it's a super great benefit. Obviously, they did it to compete with Google. And, the, and uh, what's included in that is all the products that you see listed on the screen. And, and oh, I forgot to change the Office Mac Professional dog on it. It's an old slide deck. That's Office for Mac 2016, not necessarily 2011. Sorry about that, kids. Um, and then, uh, so, so Office 365 Pro, Office 365 for Mac, Office 365 Mobile for iPhone or Android. Um, you get the, the, the storage, and, uh, um, and you can install it. Each user can install on up to five devices and mobile apps. Um, you can run it side by side with older versions. Um, it's, it's a faster installation. I mean, it's just uh, all these benefits are available. And then the way that you uh, enroll in this Office 365 Pro Plus is you simply let your, your reseller know, whoever it is that you process your agreement through, that um, you, know, you have X number of users in this case, you, 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 you count your total users rather than your FTE count. So, you know, if you have 3,000 students, tell them you have 4,000 students. If you have, you know, 500 faculty and staff, tell them you have 1,000 faculty and staff. And the reason why you always want to go over is, to, is that, you know, over the course of time, you, you, know, you may have, you know, a larger install base than what you in, initially uh, purchased. And, or, or, and it's $0, so you're not purchasing anything. Um, but the way Microsoft looks at this 
is they don't care how many you put on the order. What they care about is how many are actually actively using the software. And uh, most of the Microsoft reps, many people don't know this, are commissioned based on how many Office 365 activations you offer. Uh, you, 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 you include in your agreement. And so they want you to give this away to your students, faculty, and staff for free. They want you to use the tools, and we, they want the, the users to use, you know, they want your students and your campus community to use those tools even when they're not on campus. Um, so I highly encourage, if you haven't enrolled, if you haven't uh, set up your Office 365 tenant yet, and we're going to we're going to go into that in just a minute when we do the Volume License Service Center. Um, I would strongly suggest you work out a plan on how to do so. In addition to the Office 365 Pro Plus, the other free benefit that you get from Office 365 is the Office 365 E3. And in last September, they added all these new entitlements to the Office 365 E3 benefit. So, you get Exchange Online, Skype for Business, Yammer, all the things that you see there. Um, uh, voicemail support, rights management services, um, and, and, and again, these are accessed and deployed through the Office 365 tenant, um, which is available on the Volume License Service Center. And again, the E1 plan was available up until September as a free product. But now you get Office 365 Education or Office 365 E3, which includes all of these products at no cost to the university whatsoever. So again, it's a separate SKU on your agreement. So you have to tell your reseller, I want Office 365 E3 for this number of faculty and staff and this number of students. And then I want Office 365 Pro Plus uh, for this many faculty staff and for this many students. Um, those are separate SKUs, so you actually have, have to order both of them as separate zero dollar line items on your order. Okay, so let's take a moment. I want to actually go out to the Volume License Service Center. Tim, um, Tim I'm sorry, can I interrupt? Yeah. There was about five yeah. questions. Um, okay, so let's fire away. So, okay, great. Um, I'm just going to ask them as in the order they came in. So since AD is used for student authentications to Office 365 via ADSS in our case, are Cal licenses required for students? What if AD is also used to authenticate to use our campus Wi-Fi? Okay, so it, yes, if the students are accessing ADFS, they have to cover the student Cal. The easiest way to do that is to buy what's called a Windows external connector, and they're super cheap. A um, couple hundred dollars per server. I've, I'm not sure how many authentication servers are used, um, but the, that's basically what you what you want to. Uh, that's that's basically how you would enroll them. Is uh, is you wouldn't buy a Cal for each one of those students, like a core Cal. You would just get the external connector for the number of servers that they they plug in through. Thank you. Uh, will you be covering RDS Cal's? Um, briefly, um, when we get to the Windows Server page, I'll go into it, and then we should have time for questions so I can answer more detailed questions there. Perfect. Had a previous subscription module under my EDU license, which only allows two installs. We have the 365 now, and I'm not finding anywhere to change a subscription agreement with my one email. Any help? Ooh, maybe not. We're licensing specialists. That might be something that you have to go through Microsoft uh, uh, to, uh, to, to solve. Um, what we can do offline, if I can get your email address, I can maybe be able to connect you with an Office 365 uh, person from Microsoft or get you to the deployment webinars. Great. Um, thank you. Understood, though. When you use, when you use uh, I'm working home as a two user max, but the Office 365 has up to five installs, so I can see where the problem is, occurs. Uh, this is from Craig. EES also includes the option for FAC staff home use program, HUP. Are there any liabilities assumed by the institution if this option is enabled? Um, we'll cover that on another slide, but the basic answer is no because they, if they download it, whether it's through us or through Microsoft, they're, they're clicking a click to agree form. 
So the faculty and staff are, um, they're the ones that are liable for misuse of the program. And then finally, how difficult is it to employ Office 365 E3 without the exchange piece if you're a Google school? Yeah, good question on that. And that's one I probably can't answer as a licensing specialist. I might refer you guys back to the EDUCAUSE listserv. There's an awful lot of discussion about deployment of Office 365. Um, we've done, we've, we've worked with a lot of schools that have employed, that have done the Pro Plus without having to use an outside vendor or really get help from Microsoft at all. The tenant's pretty simple, and I think Jason's going to go into the tenant right now while we're talking and, uh, and, and show you where you, you find this information on the Service Center website. Um, E3 is a little more complex, and I know there were some issues with schools that went from live at EDU to, to uh, uh, the E3 or OZ1 at the time, and I know there's schools that have gone from Google that have needed more help than what we could give them. Great, thank so, yeah, you. That's all the questions. <coughs> okay, great. Um, Jason, go ahead and go into, so this is the Microsoft Volume Licensing Service Center. This is where you obtain all of your, your products and your benefits um, for your Microsoft subscription-based agreement. Um, and where you're going to find most of this stuff, obviously you can see across the top, your downloads and keys are found in the downloads and keys section. And if you are the administrator for the agreement, you will have specialized keys for Office Pro Plus, Windows, Windows Server, um, other products that require a volume license key. Um, but the other, the other three things that I want to point out, one is I just want to show you the administration tab. This tab that basically enables you to um, add users to the agreement, so you can you can you can take your help desk people, you can take your uh, you know your your technicians, and you can add them as users on any level, um, and and so the, so you can you can choose to give them rights to download the software and view the keys, but maybe not give them rights to the volume licensing information. You can add or subtract them as you will, and as you can see, you know we have um, a number of agreements that we manage for our our clients that uh, um, in, in, in which we we serve as the administrator um, so that's one piece that you may or may not know about um, let's go into the software assurance tab next we're going to talk about this more in the software assurance benefits these are all the benefits that are part of software assurance and you access them all through the volume license service center so in, in a slide or two I'm going to talk more about these software assurance benefits but if you say well how do I enroll in these well you enroll in right through the volume license service center and then go into the online service activation and and let's look at uh, and let's look at the office 365 tenant it's not going to show anything there you got to go over oh going to subscriptions I'm sorry so Jason, you've done a little bit with these online with the office 365 subscriptions yeah I've helped a couple schools um, figure out how to activate their tenant. Um, what you would do when you first activate is you'd go into subscriptions, you'd click on subscriptions again, it'd bring up the screen that we were just at this. Then you'd click on online service agreement list. The tenant that we're in right now has already been activated, so it's going to look a little different than yours would, but you'd see right here where it says Office 365 active, it would show unactive. Then you would click on this, And, let's see. and if it wasn't active, it'd give you a place to where you could say activate. Once you activate, whoever is your program admin for your um, agreement will receive an email from Microsoft with the detailed instructions on how to go in and actually activate your tenant and deploy your license to the users. In most cases, the way you're going to activate is through Active Directory. You're going to tie your Active Directory to the tenant. Um, and again, it's uh, for many of the schools, especially with the Office Pro Plus, pretty simple migration. Um, um, for again, for Google customers, we may not have all the answers for that, but we can steer you to some of the, some Microsoft people. That will, uh, and believe me, they want Microsoft wants to help you move from Google to Office 365, and so uh, we uh, we can help you offline with that as well. Yeah, we found that mo the hardest part was figuring out how to get to this part because there's no instructions anywhere on how to do this. But once schools, once we walked our customers to this, 
it seemed pretty easy from that point on. Okay, so uh, so this pretty much covers the volume license service center. Let's go back into the presentation. We'll go. We'll now address the uh, um, concurrent slides. Yeah, and then we'll we'll not we'll we'll now talk a little bit about software assurance benefits. So before we move on, any questions about the volume license service center? Okay. There's a lot of products and software assurance benefits that you may not know about. Um, so I'll, I'll go through this slide pretty quick. We're already starting to run a little low on time. Um, upgrade, downgrade rights, this is pretty obvious, right? You have a subscription-based agreement. You don't want to deploy anything beyond Windows 7 because you don't want to, you have not yet tested it internally as to whether it's going to work with everything that you have going on, so you're using Windows 7 instead. And then at some point in time, you're going to decide maybe to move to Windows 8.1 or move to Windows 10 after you've tested it. So the software assurance benefits gives you the ability to move up and down for whatever version of those products that you have covered. Um, you want to cover Office 2016? Great. You want to stay on Office 2013? Fine. If you want to move some over, you can do so. You, you have the right to all versions of all the products that you have covered, and you can deploy those new versions at your convenience. Um, the other cool thing about software assurance benefits is you're just entering into a subscription-based agreement. You can take out-of-compliance products and license them legally. So maybe you've got some old computers that have Windows 98 on them, or, well, Windows 98 is a bad example, but, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, previous versions of Office, Office 2007 and whatnot, and you want to, you know, that, that computer just won't run the newest version, you can run older versions on those legacy products and know that you're licensed for it. Because I know a lot, of, a lot of problem in Microsoft licensing when you license is in a perpetual model is trying to figure out, you know, where, you know, what do I own, where do I own it, when is it, when is it, you know, run out, and so on and so forth. So um, all those features are part of software assurance benefits. There's an online e-learning piece, which is sort of a mini scale of the uh, IT Academy. There are training videos on things like Office and Windows. If you buy server products, there's training versions on, on servers on how to deploy. I mean, there's a whole lot of information in online e-learning. It's great for professional development. And, uh, and again, if you want to take a step further and offer that professional development to students, I would look into IT Academy as a separate product. We talked about that a little bit before. Um, with the Microsoft Desktop Optimization Pack, this is in now included for free. You used to have to pay for it. Now, you have, now it's included for free with Windows OS Upgrade. It's, uh, it's your Microsoft Virtualization Tool. So AppFi, um, uh, UEV, uh, it includes your, your management, advanced group policy management, and BitLocker. It includes the diagnostic and recovery tool set. Right? This is all part of Windows OS upgrade. And, of course, VDA is now included as, as part of your software assurance benefits, which enables you to, uh, um, uh, to license thin clients and have them touch a virtual server uh, where they can obtain uh, applications or, or see a Windows OS without necessarily being licensed for a Windows OS. Um, and then again, we already talked about the Windows OS eligibility for Mac environment, right? Same thing with Win Thin PC. If you cover Windows OS through your academic agreement by FTE, then um, all of those uh, OSs that aren't OSs, uh, um, you, know, you, you no longer have to buy a Windows operating system to, to cover those devices. And then. Office multi-language pack, it's been available for a long time. This basically gives you the ability to uh, give users Microsoft Office and other languages. And there's a whole bunch of other languages. You obtain the multi-language pack through the download section of the volume licensing services website. And uh, so that's a benefit that's been available. I want to talk m more in detail about this TechNet Plus Direct benefit, because I I, I'm going to guess that many of you don't know it exists. Um, but if you buy five servers or more on your subscription-based agreement, you get this benefit. And basically what it gives you is, first it gives you unlimited evaluation rights. So you want to test SQL servers and, you know, and a new ERP system that you're looking at upgrading to, great. 
Um, you want to run, you know, you want to try out SharePoint, see if you can set up a SharePoint environment, you can do it. Um, you want to have a backup server and it's not going live, it's not going into production. All it is is it's redundant backup. You no longer have to license it. Um, that's what evaluation rights uh, gives you and it's, it's part of the TechNet Plus direct benefit. Um, you also get member only downloads um, and you get two free phone support instances. Um, so, again, the, the administrator will log in as the benefits administrator for the TechNet Plus Direct benefit, then they will get an access code so that when you call Microsoft, you give them the access code and then they won't charge your credit card. Um, you get access to the TechNet library, which many of you, you know, may buy separate as part of an MSDN subscription. You don't need to do that anymore. You get online concierge chat, so let's say you've used up your two tech support calls, you can chat with a Microsoft technician instead. Um, there's a lot of cool benefits tied with TechNet Plus. And some of you may have bought TechNet Plus as a separate item. You do not have to do that if you license a minimum of five servers on your agreement. Okay, so let's talk about home use. So home use is a benefit that runs that is run through uh, the Microsoft website and it basically gives uh, uh, the school the right to give perpetual versions of Office Pro Plus and Office 2016 and Mac for your faculty and staff uh, to use on their home computers for work-related purposes. Again, just like we, uh, when I answered the question before, um, when they use the home use program, it's managed by a Microsoft uh, partner uh, and, and they will have you sign a click to agree form. They'll have the faculty sign a click to agree form that, so that they have all the liability uh, if they misuse the software, um, um, and then you could, they can get either a physical media or they can get a download at a low cost. It's anywhere from 9.95 to 19.95, depending on the product. And then, and then you can activate that benefit to go directly through Microsoft through Software Assurance benefits. Um, the one area in which I want to just uh, tout ourselves is that Jerry Ed also manages the home use program. We do it through what we call a work at home store. Um, and the advantages of the work at home store is one, you get live uh, support. We have customer service people that answer our phones. But two, you can also license products besides Microsoft Office as part of the home use program. So you can give the latest version of the Windows OS. You can, if you cover Project or Visio as part of your FTE agreement, then you can give those to faculty and staff for take home rights. Um, and so we manage them for a whole bunch of schools. Our website for the work at home store, which has a pull down menu, is, uh, is listed there. If you want to see if your school, your school may already be covered, if you want to look at it there, great. If you want to talk to us about running your work at home store for you, we can do that as well. Um, and then, and then we'll, we'll take the extra step of actually um, you know, uh, promoting the program on your behalf. Um, you know, with the, the, you can put your school logo on the site and all sorts of other stuff. So I, I, I promised Beth I wasn't going to do too much selling, so I'm done selling for the day. We'll move back on to the license. So anything about software assurance or, uh, or the, the benefits that are included with the subscription-based agreement? Okay. So we are, we got about 15 one, minutes. One quick, got question. one quick yeah. question. Uh, what benefits, if any, are available to alumni? Um, other than, the, it's my understanding that Office E3 can be extended to alumni, but none of the work at home rights are. Once they leave the university, they are no longer qualified for any of the work at home software. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, so really quick, um, your add-on desk, right, we want to talk about how to license these add-on products. Um, so uh, first of all, we'll talk about the, your desktop products. Um, Project and Visio are the ones that are used most often. You can license them by either FTE or device. Very easy math on this. Um, to determine whether it's a better value to license by FTE or by device, take your FTE count and divide it by 10. If that is less than the total number of devices that you need to install the software on it, then you purchase by FTE. If it's greater, then you purchase by device. So for example, if your FTE count is 600, then you would need to have project installed on more than 60 devices to justify buying the FTE version of the program. Um, 
And so again, you, you, you can do your own math on that. Um, IT Academy is a more comprehensive version of the e-learning tool benefit, and it's available to students, faculty, and staff. Um, this is particularly useful for community college or K-12 that wants to uh, teach their students how to use PowerPoint, how to use Excel, and have access to, you know, to online learning tools, videos, and so on. Uh, uh, it's this huge library at Microsoft IT Academy, and that product costs about $1,200 a year. Um, you only need to buy one, covers your whole campus, pretty good deal for, uh, for a lot of schools. Um, Visual Studio Pro used to be licensed by FTE. It's no longer licensed by FTE. Now you license it per user and it includes MSDN. Um, if you license the Team Foundation server, then you license to the server and then you buy the CAL separately. And then other Microsoft subscription products, Dynamics, Intune, uh, training certifications are sold in packs. I'm not sure most of you know that you can buy Microsoft training certifications uh, uh, programs and uh, and uh, and dole out those certifications. At a four-year school, probably not useful, but at a community college, maybe more so. Tim, just All a right, quick so just yeah. just a quick comment. Um, Janet Janice was mentioning that she believes IT Academy has been rebranded to IT Imagine Academy. Are you aware of that? I am not. Boy, you learn something new every day. <laughs> I just looked at the price list yesterday, and I didn't see that change made. So maybe it's going to be on the March price list. Um, because we have some things that are coming in March. And uh, so, Janice, thank you for your input on that. I appreciate it. And we'll look it up. I can't believe Marcy didn't catch that when we ran this fire. Must have gone over her head. OK, so let's talk about server licensing again. For some of this is going to be review. Um, the traditional model for licensing Microsoft servers is you cover the server and then you cover every client, whether it's a user or a device. In this example, we're using a device um, separately. And then the client access license is usually you know, small change. If you bought it perpetually, you can buy Windows uh, server CALs for like $4 a CAL or $5 a CAL. Um, and then the, the server piece itself is you know, a couple hundred dollars. Um, under the under the description based agreements, most of these CALs are covered, um, but there are certain certain items in which you're going to want to license the CAL separately, um, such as forefront identity manager and a few other things. And so um, that, this is probably a good point to talk about a remote desktop CAL. Uh, there was a specific question around remote desktop CAL. Um, under the Microsoft subscription based program, and again, you can buy RDS or what used to be called terminal services through either subscription or as perpetual licenses through either of the um, perpetual license programs. Um, but it is not included as a base benefit of Windows Server. You have to buy the separate CAL in order to be able to dole out remote desktop. The, the thing that, that snags a lot of people about remote desktop is it is the one product in which the license key is not put into the Volume License Service Center. And so when you include Windows Desktop cal or Windows uh, Remote Desktop as part of your subscription-based agreement, you actually have to go into the Windows server, plug in your agreement number and the name of your organization and so on in order for those activations to become active. And then you can set your Windows server up to however many activations that you've purchased or if, if you've bought it site-wide by FTE count, then um, you know, then you would have obviously an unlimited number of, of activations for for the remote desktop cal. Um, uh, in some cases, we've we've run into this a lot where um, you have you have users from outside the network that want to be able to access um, those internal servers, and the way that you license those is you buy the remote desktop cal for your entire FTE, faculty staff FTE. And then you buy what's called an external connector, um, which gives the unlimited use from people outside of your organization. Um, you cannot buy the external connector without having an internal CAL already covered, because it, 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 it's, a, it, it's a requirement of the external connector. Um, and then those, those external connectors, they're different for each product. But a, a lot of the Microsoft products now have external connectors as separate items. Some of them, like SharePoint, 
They let external users log in for free as long as you've covered the internal users. Um, it's going to be different for each server license. So if you have individual questions about how to license external users, um, you know, we'd be glad to take those offline or to add them as an addendum to this presentation. Much of Microsoft's licensing is moving to a core licensing model. Um, SQL Server did this back in 2012. So instead of counting the servers and the number of clients that are connecting to it, that previous server cal model, what you do instead is you count the total number of physical cores uh, to determine the pricing. Um, um, you do have the ability to parse out virtual cores if they're solely dedicated to that server app. Um, but in larger organizations, what they, what they like to do is they count all of the physical cores and then use that to license the whole farm. And then that gives them the, the rights to you know, spin up as many instances as they want. Um, this, that is the case with SQL, not, not with SQL Center, but that is the case with SQL Enterprise. That will be the case with System Center um, Data Center, and it's the case with Windows Server Data Center. Um, again, not the standard versions of those products. In, in other words, let me just restate this very clearly. Um, in order to be able to spin up unlimited instances of a certain server version, you have to have the data center or the enterprise version of that product. Um, the standard versions do not include that licensing entitlement. Microsoft's theory on moving to core-based licensing is simply to allow for physical, virtual, or cloud environments for compliance. They want to make it easier, and so the Windows Server 2016 is going to move to a core licensing model very soon. System Center is also going to move to a core licensing model very soon, and uh, I believe this is the direction that Microsoft is headed permanently, so you may see other products eventually move to the core licensing model as well. Um, and, and, and so I'm going to go into SQL in more detail because it's already an established product. Um, but basically the way that you would license your SQL servers is you count the physical cores to determine the license coverage. Um, that, once you've counted those physical cores and you've licensed them, any users or devices that connect to that server, even if they're remote users, are then covered. And then again, if you buy the SQL Enterprise version, you're allowed unlimited virtual instances. Um, so if you have a, you know, if you have a farm that's, you know, got, uh, you know, eight, um, you know, eight physical servers with two processors each. Each one of those has four cores. That's a 64 core if farm. Um, you can spin up a thousand SQL Server instances if you cover that whole farm with SQL Enterprise. Um, if, if you do not want to cover that whole farm and you don't have an, enough use to justify it, then you can, as I had mentioned in a previous slide, parse out virtual cores and then just cover those for the software, but then you don't have the right to, to spin up the unlimited number of virtual instances. Um, uh, it's, it's pretty complex, and again, your particular environment may require more discussion around core licensing and how how best to, to use it, it, it how, you know, what's the most cost-effective way. Um, so we can have those discussions offline. There were some questions that came in about Windows Server 6 2016 and System Center 2016. We do not have the actual pricing or the updates as far as exactly how these programs are going to work. Um, we have been assured by both Microsoft and by our LSP that um, that the pricing matrix is going to be very similar. So, for example, if you bought Windows Server 2012, then uh, you know it was a two-processor license. That two-processor license is going to equal a 16-core license under the new model. We just don't have any information about the new models yet. Same thing with System Center. So I'm going to have to cut that short. I will say this, though. The one thing I want to say about, um, about System Center is that um, your client management licenses for SCCM and for System Center Endpoint Protection are included in the CoreCal license. So um, all you have to do is buy the server piece. Very inexpensive. It's not, it's not inexpensive to get it working because there's a lot of resources involved in System Center Config Manager particularly. But the cost of buying the System Center server is very cheap. Um, under the old model, it's like 80 bucks for a System Center standard 
a license. Okay, we have five minutes, so I want to talk about Azure. Um, first, we'll, there's two pieces of Azure. There's the AD piece, um, and then there's the uh, you know all of the server components that are available. Um, the AD piece, and I don't know if most of you know this, Active Directory Basic is a free product that you uh, purchase as a zero dollar SKU, um, just like you do with the Office 365 product. And so all we need, or all your, your reseller needs, is a, is a PO with the number of users that need AD Basic, and that can be plugged into your agreement. It's accessed as, as a subscription, just like your other Office 365 products, super, super easy. AD Premium is not free, but it, it's asked for a lot. And the main reason why it's asked for is this password reset. Uh, the ability to password reset in the cloud is super, super useful to a lot of our, our desktop support people. And so you can look up the features and benefits of Active Directory on uh, the website list below. Um, there are a, a whole bunch of other benefits that come with the, with the AD Premium. Um, but again, you know, if you want to play with it, maybe you start with the basic version, see if that's, um, you know, if you want to manage your users through the cloud. Maybe you do, maybe you don't, and it's not for me to say. And again, here's your feature set of all the Active Directory. So you can download this slide deck and then have access um, to these features. And then if, again, if you have any individual questions, we'll try to answer those for you. All right, now I want to talk about Azure Services. Um, if you have access to the EES price list, you will see a thousand SKUs on Azure. The only one that you have to pay attention to is this monetary commit SKU. It costs about $1,200 a year, and by purchasing the monetary commit SKU, basically it gives you access to the Azure portal, where you can then choose the products that you want to use. If you want to, if you want to, you know, uh, buy a bunch of storage and start storing things in Azure, it's this price, and all the prices will show up in the in the portal once you get in there. And then if you want to set up Windows, you want to run Windows servers through Azure. It has a set price, SQL Server, all those. All the different permutations of Azure are available by purchasing a monetary commitment. Um, but, and by doing that, rather than by entering into an agreement, you can enter a new agreement directly with Microsoft as well, but the monetary commit is going to give you about 40% more services for your money than going directly through Microsoft. Um, and as an example, right, storage is $240 per terabyte annually. It's super, super cheap. And I think it's easier to use than, than Amazon Web Services. Uh, as, as the owner of Journey Ed, we actually use Amazon Web Services, and we find it's pretty easy to put the data in, not so easy to get it out. And Microsoft's a little more interoperable when it comes to uh, storing your data in Azure, and uh, so I'm, I'm a pretty big proponent of it. Um, so what, what I want to suggest when it comes to Azure, don't use the price list to determine what it is that you want to do. Instead, what you do is you go up to the Azure calculator and determine what the pricing is to the calculator to set your budget, and then you purchase the monetary commitment to then uh, um, access those tools. Um, you, uh, again, as a reseller, I can tell you that um, once you place that order for the monetary commit, um, if you go over that $1,200 amount, it's just applied as overage. And so the way that we've handled it is we send out a report, um, and, and your other resellers should be able to do this as well. I'm not trying to uh, tout ourselves or whatever. Um, but you should be able to, to get an overage report on a monthly basis, kind of like a utility bill, and in which you know it, it gives you a line item listing of all the services that you're using, what the cost is of those services per unit, and then how much you have to pay in overage on you know, either a monthly or a quarterly basis. We're billing our customers quarterly. Other resellers may do things different than that. Um, um, and again, if you want to have some more detailed discussions around Azure, we'd be glad to take those calls individually offline. But um, uh, again, I can't stress enough um, how um, cost-effective the Azure cloud solution is in comparison to other types of cloud solutions. I don't think you're going to find storage any cheaper. And uh, so I'm a, I'm a huge, huge proponent 
of Microsoft Azure. And I think there's a lot of other things that you can do with it. Um, again, we're licensing specialists. We're not technical specialists. Um, but we can invoke some of those resources if you need to. All right, we're right, right at time, but we probably have time for a couple more questions if you have them. Uh, Tim, I'll give people some chance to type in. Do you want to mention the handouts at all that are available? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? We never did talk about that. Um, um, so on the, on the presentation itself, um, I wanted to give some, some cross-reference uh, to um, both Microsoft EES. There's a program guide that kind of walks through a lot of the stuff that we talked about in the presentation about the EES agreement. There's also a handout on the core CAL versus the enterprise CAL um, because um, we had a bunch of questions come in before the presentation about what core CAL is and what it does. And, and uh, so we wanted to make sure that you guys had um, access to that information. And of course, the slide deck itself is available as a download. Um, and uh, um, you know, feel free to contact Beth or contact us. I don't know if we even put our contact information on this. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm sure Beth can get you our contact information, or we can send that after the fact as a separate email to you all. Yeah. Um, no, we'll be happy to do that. We can send this okay. all out. Okay. I just want to mention, Mark. I see that you have your hand raised. He's one of our participants. Do you have a question? I have, I believe, unmuted you. Okay, might just be a mistake. Um, uh, there, it looks like there's maybe one question about um, Scott. I guess Scott uh, talked about for clients using EES and Office 365 Pro Plus, what benefits are available to alumni? Email, OneDrive, Office, all with question marks. Um. Uh, the, you, the office entitlement gets shut down once you cease to be a member. The alumni, the, e, the, the email remains an active benefit. The other features, I'd have to check on. Um, but uh, we, we know, because it was part of live at EDU that alumni email were included for as long as the school wanted. But you have to shut off the Office Pro Plus benefit once they leave the university. Great, thank you. Well, it looks like that was all of the questions. Um, I know this has been a, a very content-rich webinar, so I really thank you for your time, your energy, and your enthusiasm about this topic. For those participating, we have made a recording, and it should be available on the SIGOX website within probably by Monday. And I'll just email all the participants to let you know when that is available. But many thanks, Tim and Jason. You did a great job with this. We all appreciate it. And Beth, thank you, and thank you all for attending.